Good afternoon, Year 12s. So today we're looking at The Passionate Poet and His Muse, which follows on from Out of Winter and Annunciations. And these come fairly close together within Dobson's life. And we see here a marked transformation in the style and the tone of her poetry. Interestingly, though, the content remains quite similar. It's just more so that the approach that she takes becomes a little bit different. And those are the things I want you to look out for. We see here that her stanzas are quite different to the previous stanzas that we've encountered. They're longer in terms of lines, but here they've got, they're quite short in terms of the actual length of each particular line within the stanza. Um, and we get to see that she is still considering that elusive idea or concept that's just out of her reach. So as always, I'm going to read through the poem. Um, I'm going to highlight some key words that I think are important for us to consider, um, make a few annotations as we go, and then we'll discuss and break down the poem as we go. So I want you, before we start to, to read, to consider the word muse and what that means. Of course, it is an inspiration for an artist, usually a female for a male. Um, but in this particular sense, Dobson is looking at the poet as a universal poet, much like the artist in um, The Painter of Umbria, that she has chosen a sort of every man or an every person to embody the universal troubles or the universal concerns of any poet. And so in this particular case, she doesn't even give this particular person a name, just this concept of an archetype. So if you're not sure what an archetype is, it is a form of something that is a very typical example of that particular person or thing. So it's not like a stereotype where we make assumptions about someone. It is a character often within a story or a poem or a song that fits within the narrative that we have already for that particular kind of person. So for a hero, an archetypal hero would be someone like Superman, who has, um, you know, big muscles, he wears a cape, he rescues people. It's a very archetypal version of what a hero is. Now, of course, when we look at heroes in a more complex way, we realise that there are heroes that come in many shapes and forms. But here, Dobson is talking about the every poet, the things that all poets experience and what we expect from a particular poet, in that or they all struggle with their ideas and trying to deal with their own inspiration. Okay, so let's start reading. The passionate poet and his muse. The archetypal poet, no, over the imagined world sought his still evasive muse. By day and night escaping, skirts troubled the corner of his eye. But mostly, when the starlit sky grew tremulous towards the east, then, oh then, it seemed he held for a moment in his arm the dear enchantment of her form. Once, grown skilful in the chase, Practised in complexities, once, oh once, he caught her hand, held her prisoned in his dream, and touched her still averted face. In that self-same instant knew hopeless all along his pursuit. Felt her lovely shoulders start into wing and into leaf, and knew Apollo's chagrined grief. To that archetypal tree pilgrim poets still repair, to the season of leaf know the sweetness of her shade, in the season of the fruit, bless her for her plenteousness. When her limbs are winter bare, match with her, hers their melancholy. And beneath her roots at last lie in death commingled dust. Okay, now that we've read through the poem, hopefully you've got a little bit of a sense of some of the patterns and the rhythms. You'll have noticed once again that we have this sense of evasion or something that is elusive and just beyond our grasp, when it says here that for a moment the poet held something firm, but then it disappeared and it, and it escaped his, his arm. So this idea of something that is there, it's almost tangible, but not quite, and so he can't quite hold on to it. These are things we know she talks about throughout her poem. But there's also lots of things in here that are very weird or things that we maybe haven't encountered before within her, her text and her poems. In particular is the use of enjambment as a poetic technique. Here you'll notice that many of the thoughts flow over from one line into the next. 
So if we combine that idea of illusion or escape with this kind of flowing effect of thoughts over lines where the thoughts go and then they spill into the next one and then they spill into the next one only to come up at the end of a stanza or at the end of a particular line with a very distinct piece of punctuation. What on earth could this possibly mean? Why is she doing this? Now we know of course she's doing it on purpose and we're doing, she's doing it to create some kind of added layer of meaning. So the question is why? What is the purpose of having these, these ideas that flow between lines within the same stanza? Why does she not include them all on the one line? So if we think of words to describe a line or a thought continuing over two lines, what are some adjectives that we might use? We might use words like unfinished, continuing. We might think of words like uncontrolled or uncertain. There's certainly a sense of movement within this poem that is not necessarily present in all of the previous poems beforehand. What is she actually trying to say? Um, and what, in fact, is moving away from her? Or is that she's trying to grasp? Well, in this case, he, the, the speaker of our poem, which is the poet. What is it that he's trying to grasp? So if we keep a list at the top, we don't have answers just yet, but we're thinking about something that is elusive, something that is moving away, and something that escapes. Okay, so let's hold on to that for the moment and come back in later. Let's look at the second two stanzas because they're the ones that I think will give us the most trouble when we first read them. Because she starts to talk about um, the, the still averted face and all of a sudden this thing, this, this um, moment that the poet is chasing in the first stanza becomes pers personified. Why does this become a female? Now, of course, we know because we're talking about a muse, and that's, that's the most common gender associated with a muse. So, of course, it makes sense to um, fem feminise this. And let's look at the language that he's using to the speaker of this poem, and then, of course, Dobson as the poet herself, using to describe this person, this female, this muse. We've got dear enchantment of her form. We've got, um, sorry, touched her still averted face, a dream. We've got lovely shoulders. And we've got this contrast between her beauty and the speaker's hopelessness. So we've got a little bit of a juxtaposition here between two ideas. And again, we've got a juxtaposition between the movement of this person and the stillness of the poet. So if we look at this muse, this person, maybe not as an actual person, but as an idea, we know that Dobson is, is concerned with creation, creativity, and inspiration, and often that very fine line between the two. Um, how do we go from inspiration to creation? Can that creation ever live up to the inspiration that the poet has or the artist has? Now, this is something she's already spoken about and she's touched upon, um, but here she's really started sort of dealing with something quite personal, I feel, um, in that there is something that is very, very much about dealing with this inspiration as a person. Um, whereas previously, all of her, her poems about this kind of thing have been very grand and very um, abstract, whereas this one is not so much. Instead of talking about the cracking paint on Vermeer's paintings or the pottery wheel as kind of the crux of the universe or the oblivion that, that exists behind the curtains of life, all very grand ideas, all very kind of moving, abstract, thoughtful ideas, but nothing with any real, real emotion behind them. Here we have the speaker of the poem grasping for someone's hand and this hand there momentarily and then disappearing. 
So all of a sudden, this connection between whatever she's talking about becomes incredibly personal. She humanizes what's going on. Now, we know that the previous two poems that you have looked at deal with her grief over losing her daughter. Very, very real emotion. We also know that at this particular point in time, she starts to question her faith. So if that's the case, then let's look at the third stanza. She talks about pilgrim poet. Now, to create a pilgrimage is to journey somewhere for some kind of enlightenment or um, connection to something greater, often associated with religion. Now, we know that she's a Christian. We know that there's a lot of biblical references that pop up within her writing. Um, and you'll deal with this in the next poem, um, the, the later poem that you're going to study in Eutychus. But we see here perhaps that maybe she is questioning a little bit about her own position as an artist, as a Christian. She's sort of questioning, well, what is my place in, in this life? And why am I actually writing? Because writing is not always a fulfilling aspect. And I want you to have a look, particularly in this last stanza, where is a sense of bittersweet moroseness about the fact that she is a writer and she can't always achieve. Let's look in particular at the imagery that she utilises within this final stanza. We have the archetypal tree to which the pilgrim poets still repair, which means that there's an image, a symbol of a tree, where the poets go to find their inspiration. Okay. Now, obviously, she's not talking about a real tree. This is a metaphorical tree. So is this the tree of inspiration, the tree of ideas? What is it that she's talking about? And she says they still repair, which means they journey there all the time. No matter how much their moment of inspiration their creative thought does escape them, like the, the personified moment of inspiration in the previous two poems, despite the fact that inspiration is fleeting, inspiration does disappear, they still go there. They still journey to this moment, this tree, this, this concept to try and generate ideas. And she says that in the season of leaf, know the sweetness of her shade. In the season of the fruit, bless her for her, her plenteousness. Those are all very positive images here. Where if when the tree of inspiration or the tree of creative thought has its, 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 wor its blooming and it's doing what it should be doing, then it's going to give the poets what they want. It's going to give them shade if that's what they need. It's going to give them fruit if that's what they need. And if everything's working, then that moment of creation can be a wonderful thing. But at the latter half of the stanza here, we see the other side of things. For when she says, when her limbs are winter bare, match with hers their melancholy. So when things are not working in a poet's life, maybe their creative thought is not working either. And I want you to think about what has just come beforehand in Dobson's life, before this poem. She's gone through one of the toughest times in her life. She's dealing with loss. She's dealing with a whole bunch of different things that she hasn't felt before. Is this a moment where she questions her own role as an artist and as a poet? Is her creativity and her inspiration suffering here? When she says, beneath her roots at last lie in death commingled dust. I want you to think about what that final two lines might mean. It's kind of got a para rhyme in there, that last and dust. It's got the st sound there. It's got a sort of finite ending to it. It's a very, very unusual poem for her. But at the same time, very, very typical. She's still talking about creativity. She's still talking about elusiveness. But there's not necessarily the optimism that comes in those previous poems. That's just the way I see it. Let me know what you think.